Wonderful. So we're in the home stretch. We have four classes left, including today's class. This class and then next week. We have chapter nine to finish up, which is super short. We'll finish that no problem today. We have a little bit of chapter 10. So what we did is we sat down with I sat down with Terry and with Dr. Banks, who's teaching organic two. We kind of decided what we wanted to cover and maybe didn't want to cover and make sure people are ready for next semester and this sort of thing. Uh, so what we did is we kind of took what we normally teach in unit 10 and we pared it down quite a bit. So there's like kind of five reactions in chapter 10 that we're going to do, although it's not really five. It's more like three. It's just how I happen to count them. And we cut a lot of material out of that chapter. So there's like two or three concepts that we're going to cover in chapter 10. So I expect we might start chapter 10 today. We'll be finished at probably Monday. That will leave Wednesday and Friday next week for review. And then we have our exam on the 19th. What else do I have to tell you? Nothing really. Everything is going pretty well, I think. So in chapter nine, unit nine, module nine, whatever you want to call it, I think we use all three of those, those terms. Uh, we've been talking about radical halogenation of alkanes, and I just want to briefly draw through the mechanism that we covered last class, which was radical chlorination. And, and this overall reaction looks something like, um, you know, if you have ethane, plus Cl2, this would give you chloroethane and HCl. Said this was a radical mechanism, and normally we need something to initiate the reaction, so we use either heat or light. So that little triangle, as you've seen before, means heat, and the H nu, this little symbol here, means light. And to do light, I, I, literally all you do is like you take a light bulb and you hold it close to your reaction. Make sure there's light shining on your reaction. Um, so what happens is this has sort of a, this mechanism has three phases. And the first phase is called initiation. And this is where you have one molecule of Cl2. And what happens is this undergoes hemolysis. The CLCL bond breaks like that. And you get two chlorine radicals. So if you count up all those electrons, you can see there's one of them that's unpaired. And it's got seven altogether, so it doesn't have a full octet. This is a free radical because the electrons are not all paired. And initiation is just any step that creates radicals out of something that wasn't a radical. So that would be this, this example. Once you have your radicals, we're ready to go. We're off to the races. And the next two steps are called propagation. And this is where you would have CH3CHH kind of mixing my formats here, right? This is, looks like kind of like a half of it is like full form and half of it is condensed structural formula. But if you're OK with that, I'm OK with that. So our chlorine radical comes along and it does a reaction called a hydrogen abstraction. And what happens is one of the CH bonds breaks such that one of the electrons in that bond gets together with the lone electron that's in the chlorine to make an HCl bond. The remaining electron that was in that bond goes on to the chlorine. So we use these half arrowheads, a single electron moving. And what you end up with is CH3CHH dot and HCl. So a propagation step started with a radical, which is the chlorine radical, and finished with a different radical, in this case, the ethyl radical. Then what happens is the ethyl radical 
you can kind of think of this step A and then step B of propagation is the ethyl radical will collide with another molecule of Cl2. Remember when we started this reaction, we had a lot of Cl2 and we had a lot of ethane. That's all we mixed together. Shine light, you make a small amount of, of these radicals and then the, these propagation steps start to take place. So this propagation step looks identical to the previous one, except bonds are breaking. One electron from the CLCL bond gets together with the lone electron from the carbon. The other one goes to the other chlorine and what you end up with is CH3, CH2, Cl plus Cl dot. So propagation step A started with the chlorine radical, finished with the ethyl radical. Step B starts with that ethyl radical and finishes with a chlorine radical. So that chlorine radical can then go do step A again and go around and find a new molecule of ethane and do step A over again, make a new ethyl radical, which can then find another Cl2 and do step two again. So these two steps, A and B, just keep happening one after the other until either you run out of starting material or you get a termination step. Termination step. That would look better if I just termination, wouldn't it? So a termination step is any step where two radicals come together and combine. So let's say we have an ethyl radical dot plus this so this has gotten rid of our radical and any two radicals can come together and combine to have a termination step but termination steps are rare and the reason they're rare is the concentration at any point in time in this reaction of, of free radicals is extremely low compared to the concentration of chlorine or ethane or products. So because the concentration of these radicals are really low, the probability that they will find each other and collide is also low. All right. So these termination steps, you probably have thousands and thousands of propagation steps for every one termination step. But eventually, all things must come to an end. Uh, termination steps will eventually accumulate, slow down these propagation steps, and the reaction will eventually come to a, a halt. Unless you keep pumping it with more initiation steps, unless you keep shining light on it, keep eating it, whatever, make new radicals to finish it up. So we talked about this reaction quite a bit last class. We said that chlorination um, was not very selective what that means is if you had a molecule like this and you treated it with cl2 and let's say light you're going to get a big wide variety of chlorinated products in fact you're going to probably get some of all possible chlorinated products that You know, that has a number of stereoisomers and so on and so on and so on. Emma says, does that mean that this is a slow reaction if the termination step is less likely to occur compared to propagation? No, in fact, termination is what stops the reaction. Or termination steps slow down or stop the reaction. So the less likely termination steps are, the faster your reaction is likely to be. These chlorination reactions actually happen quite quickly. Um, they're usually done for small alkanes and they're usually done in the gas phase. Yeah, no problem. So this is a, a big weakness of this reaction is that it gives you a big variety of different products if you have more than one product possible. Uh, like in this example, there's going to be one, two, three, four, five constitutional isomers possible plus a whole host of stereoisomers possible here. So you're gonna get a lot of different products. So it's usually done when there's only one possible product. 
and you have a symmetrical alkane to start with. Uh, so we're going to actually go back and look at a different one, which is, well, it's the exact same reaction using bromination instead of chlorination. So it's Br2 versus Cl2. has the identical mechanism. You have Br2, makes two bromine radicals. Those bromine radicals abstract to hydrogen. Propagation steps, termination steps, everything looks exactly the same, except bromine is there instead of chlorine. Uh, what we see, though, is when you do bromination of an alkane, they tend to be much more selective than chlorine. Chlorine will give you, will just kind of go everywhere. It'll abstract the first hydrogen it blunders into. You'll get a big variety of products. Bromine is quite selective. Bromine is choosy. It doesn't just go for any old hydrogen. So it's, you can see that in this particular alkane, um, there's a trace of the two products that are primary alkyl halides. There's a, a decent amount, 8% or so of the secondary one, but almost all of it, 91%, excuse me, not COVID, uh, almost like 91% is the top right one, which is, it gives you the tertiary alkyl halide. So bromination is the same reaction, but it's selective. It gives you the major product will be tertiary. And the reason it does that is it goes through the most stable radical intermediate. And um, for that reason, you're going to get that product as major. That makes this a useful reaction in an example where multiple products are conceivably possible, but there's only one that you want. So if we go back to this example that we had here with chlorination, if you do the same reaction with bromine, um, this is gonna be your major product. And in fact, for this course, you can ignore the fact that there's going to be a couple of percent of all those other possibilities. As far as you are concerned, this reaction is selective for tertiary centers, for methines. Methines is when you just have a CH. So in a case like this, this is the only site it's going to go because it's the only place it can go and give you a tertiary alkyl halide. And the mechanism goes via this radical, which is the most stable possible radical you can get from this molecule by removing a hydrogen atom. And it's because this is a stable radical that this gives you that as a major product. And you might say, well, it's the same radical for chlorine. Why doesn't chlorine be selective? And the reason is just that chlorine radicals are much less stable than bromine radicals. Chlorine radicals are really reactive. They're just going to react with whatever they come across. They don't care how stable the um, resulting radical, carbon-centered radical is going to be. So chlorine goes everywhere, bromine goes on tertiary sites. That's the take-home message with that. Great. Uh, the next reaction we're going to be doing is radical addition of HBr. We already did addition of HBr. If you take HBr and react it with an alkane, we said it goes through electrophilic addition, gives you a carbocation, might rearrange, Markovnikov addition, no like loss of stereochem or no stereochem. It's not anti, it's not sin. Um, it turns out, though, if you do the reaction in the presence of peroxides, peroxides are molecules with an oxygen-oxygen bond, like hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. You can have organic peroxides, which are carbon, oxygen, oxygen, carbon. Organic peroxides uh, can be explosive, so you have to be like a little bit careful. Like, for example, this peroxide uh, will crystallize and form. Yeah, it's shock sensitive, so if you like touch it or hit it, it'll explode. Uh, so you got to be a little careful of that. I actually worked on a research project once where we used to use like a lot of this compound that had T-butyls. This one is not explosive. It's T-butyl, 
but it's classified with all the other explosive peroxides. So we had like a liter of this stuff as waste that we wanted to dispose of. And the waste disposal company wanted um, like over $10,000 for us to get rid of it because it wasn't dangerous, but it was in the same class of compounds of ones that are dangerous. Um, so my supervisor at the time took the container up to the roof of the building and took like a stainless steel pot and poured it in and set it on fire. We got rid of it that way. So yeah, there's always a way around. But anyway, if you use a peroxide and hopefully a peroxide that's not explosive, like maybe this one we have here at the bottom, uh, that's usually how we write it, R-O-O-R, -O -O -R, where R is just some alkyl group. Uh, it causes the same reaction to take place, addition of HBr, but it swaps the regiochemistry. It makes it anti-Markovnikov if you add the peroxides in there, which doesn't make sense with the carbocation. And what happens is the mechanism changes when you put the peroxides in there. Uh, it doesn't work for HCl, it doesn't work for HI, just HBr, but we can do the anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr if we add peroxides in there with it. So this is not consistent with the carbocation. Carbocation, all the carbocation addition reactions went Markovnikov. This one's anti, this goes the other way around. So like all radical reactions, this one also has initiation, propagation, and termination steps. Initiation begins with the peroxide. One thing about peroxides is those oxygen-oxygen bonds are quite weak. They'll easily break to give you two oxygen-centered radicals like this RO dot. That RO dot, not very stable. It's missing an electron from a full octet. It's oxygen, so oxygen is electronegative. It really doesn't want, like it really wants to have its full octet. It wants all of its electrons. So what it will do is it will find a molecule of HBr. And when I say find, it'll randomly collide with a molecule of HBr. And you get the first propagation step that you see here. The O dot abstracts a hydrogen atom and it leaves you with this bromine radical that you see here. Bromine radical, what it will do is it will add itself to the double bond. So you can see there's two arrows here. That's two electrons that are the pi bond. One of those electrons goes and couples with the electron from bromine to make this CBr bond. The other electron goes on to the other carbon. So you can think of the bromine atom coming, adding to the alkene and leaving a radical on one side or the other of the double bond. When it does that, it wants to leave the radical on the side that gives you the more stable radical. So tertiary radicals, just like carbocations, are more stable than primary. So it wants to add the bromine to the less substituted side so that the radical ends up on the more substituted side. Then what that can do is abstract a hydrogen from another HBr, regenerate our bromine radical, and that can do step one again, like A and B, right? And then it alternates A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. We start our chain mechanism again, our chain reaction, and it keeps going in a sequence until you run out of alkene or you run out of HBr. Or enough termination steps pile up that the reaction slows down and grinds to a halt. But if you still have peroxide left, you can shine more light or heat it again or whatever and, and keep it going, get it going again. So any two of these radicals can combine, just like in the previous examples, as termination steps. Any two radicals you see here can potentially come and combine and make what we call a closed shell molecule. Closed shell just means full octet if it's in row two. Full duet if it's in row one. Um, there we go. So that's a nice reaction to have in our back pockets because we can add HBr to do Markovnikov addition, or you can add HBr with peroxides to do anti-Markovnikov addition. So you can add it either way around. We have the same thing for hydration. 
you can use oxymercuration demercuration to add Barkovnikov, or you can use the hydroboration oxidation to do an anti Markovnikov. So we have these options now. We can decide exactly, you know, with precision. We have this molecule, we want to add an atom here, we want to add an atom there. We have conditions that allow us control over how that addition happens. Two more quick ones. These are reactions that are more FYI and are not ones that I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to test you on these. Um, but they're very important, one from an industrial standpoint, the other from a health standpoint. First one is radical polymerization. Um, radical polymerization is done, I think I mentioned last time, if you have like a filling, but most plastics or many plastics uh, are made through the same process. And what happens, you need an initiator and diacyl peroxides with an OO bond that's weak, that can make radicals quite easily, are often used. You can buy these for this purpose. And what happens is they give you this kind of a radical, which can undergo decarboxylation to give you this alkyl radical, a secondary alkyl radical. Then what can happen is this can add to an alkene, like in this case, ethene. Uh, and what that does is it adds a two carbon unit and leaves you with another carbon centered radical. You can add then another one to extend the chain and another one, so on, so on, and make really long chains like this. This step can happen again and again and again, and it keeps adding to the end of the polymer. And you can get like thousands or millions of these units added and make these extremely long chains. And this is how you'd make a plastic like polyethylene using this radical mechanism. Uh, if you used propylene instead, you'd make polypropylene. If you use styrene, which looks like this, you'd make polystyrene. So you can kind of make any radical you want. There's other methods to do polymerization, but radical is one of the most common. So ethylene gives you polyethylene. Ethene, I think, is the IUPAC name for ethylene. Ethylene is what it's often called. Bananas produce this. It's the ripening agent in bananas. Um, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, uses vinyl chloride. So you styrene, Teflon, if you have all fluorines on there. Uh, methyl methacrylate, again, has an alkene which can polymerize, makes polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, which is plexiglass. So this radical polymerization is very important industrially because of all these materials that we get from it. Right. Because these chains are really long, um, they're very unrecognizable to many biological organisms. Um, so enzymes, for example, would have a very difficult time breaking down these, which is both a pro and a con. Pro is that these will, you know, they're durable, they're sturdy, they'll last. The con is that they don't decompose in the natural environment. So if litter ends up in there. Um, yeah, as you know, plastic sticks around. The other application of radicals, which is negative, is called lipid peroxidation. It's the radical mechanism that takes place in our cells. And lipid peroxidation is a reaction that happens to our lipid membranes. And um, it results from radicals that are naturally formed inside of our cells as a result of cellular respiration. So cellular respiration uh, of course, it's the biochemical process that converts carbohydrates and other fuel sources into energy in the form of ATP. It can leak out. You know, we talk about how biology, many biological processes are perfected. Uh, this is one that's not perfected. Okay, it, Our enzymes do produce some amount of radicals which are very damaging because radicals will often react indiscriminately. Not only that, it's not just one and done. It's not like you made one radical. It, okay, it killed a protein. We lost the protein, no big deal. No, they start off chain mechanisms that don't just kill one protein, but it starts off these chain reactions that can kill many proteins or many nucleic acids or whatever it is that your cell needs to function. Uh, so these radical mechanisms inside of our cells are potentially very bad for our cells. And rather than evolve 
a more efficient process that doesn't produce radicals. Instead, what we've done is evolved a whole series of like stopgap measures to prevent this problem from getting out of hand. So exactly what happens is you can make an oxygen centered radical, typically like a hydroxyl radical is what this one's called from cellular respiration. And in your membranes, your lipid membranes around every cell, you can have these long nonpolar chains that often have double bonds in them. I drew it as trans, but I think often they're cis. And you can see that there's this hydrogen that is next to the double bond, next to the alkene. What can happen is those hydrogens are relatively easily abstracted by something like a hydroxyl radical to make water. And it leaves you with a carbon centered radical in the lipid on the actual uh, fatty acid chain. Although I guess it's not technically a fatty acid because it has phosphates at the end. And I don't know, I'm not a biochemist, I'm an organic chemist. Uh, anyway, so you get this carbon centered radical form in your membrane, and that can react with oxygen, so oxygen in our cells, and oxygen adds to make this kind of a radical, which is called a lipid peroxyl radical. What this does is then can react with the neighboring chain. So there's all kinds of chains all sandwiched together, all sort of flowing back and forth. This can react with the neighbor, abstract a hydrogen from the neighbor to leave you with this lipid peroxide. And then actually what happens is this actually cuts the chain and the bottom of the chain breaks off. So this process bit by bit will gradually decompose your membranes, which is not good. Um, it can stiffen the membranes if it happens to a lesser extent, which is also not good. And because this is a chain mechanism, once you start it, it could hypothetically spread all through your membranes uh, very quickly because they're already really close together. Radicals can go boop, 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 boop. It can propagate across your cell membranes and this would be very bad for your cell. So what do we do to cure this? We have in our cell membranes vitamin E. And vitamin E has this structure, and as you can see, it has this long nonpolar chain. That non-long polar chain causes vitamin E to anchor itself in our membranes. It doesn't like freely floating in water. It's not very water soluble, but it loves to have that big long chain in a lipid membrane. And then what it has is this OH group where if one of those radical chain mechanisms comes along and bumps into vitamin E, vitamin E will give that OH hydrogen atom to produce something called a phenoxyl radical, which looks like this. And that phenoxyl radical is very stable because that is resonance stabilized by that ring. There's lots of different resonance structures that you can draw with that oxygen dot that makes that oxygen much, much less reactive than all of the other the normal carbon centered radical that we started with. The other thing is that these methyl groups here are kind of bulky. They prevent that oxygen from act from really attacking centers that are well protected. So vitamin E is sort of like a sacrificial. It sacrifices its hydrogen. It stops the, the lipid peroxidation mechanism and it sits there as a stable free radical in your membrane. So we call this an antioxidant. It stopped the oxidation of your membranes. Uh, sometimes it's called a chain breaking antioxidant because it broke the chain mechanism that would be just degrading and destroying our membranes. Um, so vitamin E, it's not a one and done. Actually, vitamin E, uh, so this is the, the mechanism for what vitamin E would do. If those radicals are propagating through your membrane, vitamin E can donate its hydrogen atom, stop the radical chain mechanism in your chains, and give you this phenoxyl radical. But vitamin E, uh, yeah, it doesn't get consumed in this process. It gets regenerated, and it gets regenerated by vitamin C. So vitamin E and vitamin C work together. 
vitamin E is kind of stationary. It's stuck in your membrane. But vitamin C is water soluble. It can flow around your cell, it can come in and out, it's a small molecule. It's much more active. And what it does is it puts hydrogen atoms back on your vitamin E. It restores your vitamin E back into its active antioxidant form. And, you know, the mechanism is here. I'm not, you don't have to worry about the details here. People have worked it out. Um, but that's why we need vitamin E and vitamin C. So vitamin E is part of our diets. It's a necessary antioxidant to keep our cell membranes healthy. And vitamin C is sort of like a, you need more of it because your body goes through more of it. You, it's it's sort of a, it's sacrificed every time it goes and repairs. Vitamin C does a lot of things, but that's one of the things that vitamin C does. Um, so having realized that vitamin E is an antioxidant, in fact, I believe the person who discovered this is Canadian, and I believe it is um, Keith Ingold, who is the son of Chris Ingold, who I talked about before. Chris Ingold was the person who discovered E1, E2, SN1, SN2, electrophilic addition, nucleophiles, electrophiles, uh, basically this course. So vitamin E is, is a natural antioxidant. There are other natural antioxidants like, well, resveratrol, it's, it's found in red wine. Um, people, I think the jury's still out, I think, on this molecule, whether it's actually an effective antioxidant for us if we consume wine or not. Um, it has the same aromatic alcohol group that we see in vitamin E. Polyphenols, see this one has all kinds of these same sorts of, of functional groups. This one from raspberries, very complex. Um, but these would be antioxidants you get from your diet. Uh, it's believed, you know, I don't think this molecule finds its way intact into your cell, but hypothetically, this could break radical reactions in your body. BHT, though, is a synthetic one, and it's it's sort of like a, it's a model of vitamin E. It's the same group. They realize these methyl groups help the radical, um, help, help its activity by making the oxygen, once it's a radical, less reactive. So they went big. They put T-butyl groups on here. BHT stands for butylated hydroxytoluene. So the butyls are the two arms. The hydroxy is here, and then the rest of the molecule, methylbenzene, is called toluene. Great. So, BHT is found in, it's a food additive. You find it in, they used to just add it to things like cereal to prevent spoilage, because a lot of spoilage of food is, is radical chain mechanism processes. Uh, but people don't like eating industrial chemicals as much as they once did. So now often it'll say, if you buy cornflakes or something, it'll say BHT is added to the packaging material to maintain freshness. So, yeah. TBHQ is another one, actually. TBHQ is a similar molecule, which is added to, I believe, fryer oils. And it's used, um, again, to prevent radical chain mechanisms. It's, it's, generally speaking, a preservative. It keeps things from spoiling. Oh, yeah, this is TBHQ. Uh, so TBHQ is one of these um, food ingredients that certain people are uh, very nervous of, even though it's been well studied and known to be safe. This is from Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, who says, perhaps the most alarming ingredient in a chicken McNugget is tertiary butyl hydroquinone, or TBHQ, an antioxidant derived from petroleum that's either sprayed directly on the nugget or the inside of the box to help preserve freshness. <clears throat> According to Consumer's Dictionary of Food Additives, TBHQ is a form of butane, lighter fluid. So now you guys are organic chemists. You guys have a couple of months of organic chemistry behind you. This is butane. I think that's lighter fluid. You can get it out of natural gas. Sure. Is that, what, how much truth is there in this statement? It's a form of butane. What do you mean it's a form of butane? It has a butyl, a tertiary butyl group on it. 
does that make it a form of butane? Is that a meaningless state? Is that a meaningful statement? No, not at all. Doesn't mean anything. Um, if you're interested, it is very similar to the chemical that they use for anal bleach. If you didn't know that's a thing, it's a thing. Anal bleach is structure. So that's pretty close. It's like butylated anal bleach. So if the purpose of this entry is to make you grossed out because it's a form of butane, uh, they could have done better. Anyway, they complain about all of these things that consuming a single gram of TBHQ can cause. Five grams of TBHQ can kill you, uh, which is why they don't put a lot of TBHQ in food, right? You can, it's very effective in very, very small amounts. So a, a gram, to get a gram of this, which is what you would need to get some of these negative side effects, um, would require you eating an unrealistic amount of food. So this is a, a post by Food Babe. I'm not sure if you know who that is. She, she's sort of fading, I'd say, a little from the limelight. Um, but she sort of paraphrased what Michael Pollan said in his book and nearly copied it exactly, complaining that um, we shouldn't be eating fried chicken sandwiches from places like Chick-fil-A because of this small amount of this food additive that's added in there. And this is very common. You find this on the internet all the time. People talking about organic molecules in our food. To get to that one gram that they both mentioned, you need to eat 278 of these burgers at once. And I'm not saying that, you know, we should be putting all these chemicals in our foods and they're great, but it's totally blinding people, I think, to the fact that the issue with this many burgers, like that's probably too many in a year, uh, is that they're full of fat and salt and probably, you know, highly refined grains and sugar and, and all those other things that you would find in a burger like this. So, you know, I, I think if this is the thing that you're worried about from all these burgers causing you negative health effects, you're, I think you're missing the point. Is the same for spicy junior chicken sandwich? Uh, yeah, probably. They add TBHQ not to the food itself. They add it to the fryer oil that it's fried in. So anything that's deep fried, probably the exact same thing. By the way, this is the uh, uh, study that was done by the European Food Safety Authority back in 2004 on tertiary butyl hydroquinone. Um, anyway, they say it's safe. They have Limits here, the ADI is the acceptable daily intake of up to 0.7 milligrams per kilogram with no ab ab adverse observable side effects. And so what they do is they take that same amount, divide it by 100, and that's what they set as the regulation for what can be in human food. So that means you can have 20 burgers a day and safely remain under your scientifically determined acceptable daily intake for Chick-fil-A chicken burgers for TBHQ. Not that I'm recommending 20 of these a day, but hey, according to science, this is what's safe. Uh, all right, so this is a summary of our reactions that you need to know for this chapter. Addition of Cl2 and Br2, which are the same, you need to be able to draw that initiation, propagation, termination mechanism. Same for both. Uh, the only difference between CL2 and BR2 is that the BR2 is, um, it is selective for tertiary centers. Then we did radical addition of HBR, which you need to draw the mechanism for that. Same initiation, propagation, termination we looked at. And then the last two are kind of more FYI. I'm not going to get you to draw mechanisms for those, and I'm not going to give you questions. I'm not going to test you on five and six. So really what we have here is one, two, four. And the reason why it goes one, two, four is there used to be a three, which I cut. Okay, The three was 
Remember the, the dissolving metal reduction from chapter eight? That went through the mechanism for the dissolving metal reduction because that was a radical mechanism. So basically it wasn't a new reaction. It was just inserting a new mechanism to explain an old reaction that we had learned in a previous unit. Great. What I would like to do is do a quick introduction to the next unit, which is 10, but it says 11 on the first slide, 10. Um, this unit is on alcohols and ethers. We've already looked at alcohols and ethers a little bit in previous other chapters. There's elements from this unit that are going to reinforce things that we've already done previously. Particularly, we've looked at in unit seven, substitution and elimination reactions of alcohols. Um, so we're going to just, this has a, a couple of, I would say, interesting points that we can add on to our understanding of these. Once we finish these couple of ones, I'd like to kind of step back and put all of the reactions we've learned together. Combinations and sequences. We have a lot of variations now. Some of them might be familiar to you. Some of them you're probably still not quite sure on, but we want to get there. OK, this first reaction is reaction of alcohols with PBr3 or PCl3. So this is a reaction that will convert an OH to a bromine. We already know a reaction that does this. If you take an alcohol and react it with HBr, it will do a substitution reaction, SN1 or SN2, depending on the alcohol starting structure. Will the sapling module of chapter nine be due a week from today? Um, I'll have to get back to that point because we're not allowed to have work due after the last class. So my suspicion is that we're going to post it and not make it worth points. So PBR3, we can use HBR. HBR will do this reaction. Not always the best though. Why? HBR causes sometimes rearrangements. Sometimes, well always, you'll lose stereochemistry. It makes a carbocation that's flat meaning you can get RRS if you're adding to one side or the other, and you can rearrange it. So PBR3 is sort of a, another way of converting the OH to an alcohol. And this is the mechanism for it. The alcohol acts like a nucleophile. It does an SN2 on the phosphorus. So it knocks out Br- and it makes this kind of weird looking group. That weird looking group is a little bit like OH2 plus. The positively charged oxygen, that becomes a very good leaving group. Bromide that was kicked out in the previous step can come in the second SN2 and replace that oxygen group. So this isn't really a new mechanism. Like it's, yeah, it's a new molecule you haven't seen before, but it's like exactly the same steps as if this was HBr. Okay, it attacks something, bromine comes off, bromine comes back and attacks. The nice thing about this reaction is there's no carbocation. This is SN2, and it gives you inversion, like all SN2s. So this, you know, it's a new reaction. It's the first reaction of this unit, but it's not really new. Okay. So the bromine comes, knocks the group out, you get inversion. So this is like for secondary alcohols, this is a great substitution for HBr because secondary alcohols in particular, A, lose st stereochemistry, B, um, rearrange. This does neither of those. It inverts the stereochemistry, but we can plan for that. We just don't want to lose all our RRS if we spend a lot of time trying to make RRS. It works great for methyl alcohols or methyl alcohol. It works great for primary alcohols. It works great for secondary alcohols, but this reaction does not work on tertiary. Can you guess why that is? Uh, 
kind of. Like if you took this molecule and you put an alkyl group back there, we're asking it to do an SN2. And tertiary centers can't do SN2s because it's too big, it's too bulky. So you can't do SN2s, so this reaction is no good. It's great for secondary, great for primary, smaller, not good for tertiary. So we now have sort of two variations here, right? If you took this alcohol, for example, secondary alcohol, as a chiral center, if you used HBr, you'd get this. You'd protonate the alcohol, water would come off, you have a secondary carbocation, it would rearrange to a tertiary, and you'd get that. No stereochemistry, no chiral centers, rearrangement, you've changed your molecule. So if you don't want that to happen, you could use PBR3 and go this way instead. And that'll convert it to a bromide that way. No rearrangements in, and inversion. Or you can use PCL3, exact same thing. Same mechanism, same steps, same outcome, same product. There's no PF3 or PI3 that can do this reaction. There's PBR and PCL3. All right, so this is just summary, really. I mean, this reaction, kind of quick, summarizes the features of when you might want to use one versus when you might want to use the other. If it's tertiary alcohol, you got to use HBr. You can't use PBR3. Otherwise, PBR3 is almost always a better option. Now, why would you want to turn an alcohol into a BR anyway? Well, BR is a good leaving group, right? So BR is a good leaving group by substituting an OH for a BR. You can then do substitution reactions, SN2, all these uh, elimination, whatever. We can do all these other reactions that we've already kind of figured out that alkyl halides can do. Sometimes, though, you don't have to convert it to a halide to make it into a good leaving group. We've seen that OH groups on their own are terrible leaving groups, right? You can't do this reaction, for example, that we see right here. Chloride is not going to come in and knock out hydroxide because hydroxide is a strong base. Strong bases typically make very bad leaving groups. So what would we do here? We would protonate the alcohol with a strong acid, and then we would do our substitution reaction, and then we could do our SN2. Or we could react it with PBR3, turn it into the bromo, and then we could do an SN2 with NACN or something like that. Okay. But in this case, where we want to use a strong acid to convert this to, eight, to the chloride, there's lots of examples where you can't just take your molecule and dump in a bunch of strong acid like HCl and expect the other parts of your molecule to remain happy. For example, let's say you wanted to do this reaction, convert the OH to I. What would we do? Well, based on our chapter seven knowledge, we would take HI, mix it in there, that would do an SN1, SN2 substitution, convert the OH to an iodine. Problem is with this molecule is it's got a double bond on the other side of it. We also know now from chapter eight that HI will add to a double bond, do Markovnikov. Yeah, it'll do this transformation over here, but it'll also screw up that part of your molecule. So this is the problem with organic chemistry. We, we learn all these reactions and look very useful. You know, they work all the time. We can convert this to this, to this, to this. But when you have a molecule that has any complexity at all, and by that complexity, I mean two or more functional groups on it, you got to be very careful if you add something that's going to do a reaction in one spot that you want it to react, that it doesn't also react somewhere else and ruin a part of the molecule that you need to keep intact. And this is a great example. This is a pretty simple molecule, two functional groups, an alkene and an alcohol, both happen to react with HI, so this is not a reaction that you would plan out. 
or you might not think of it. You do it, it ruins the other part of your molecule, and okay, that sucks. Learning, go back and try it again. Um, so what we're going to be looking at at the beginning of next class is how we can turn an alcohol into a leaving group so that we can selectively do reactions on just that OH without resorting to like strong acids that can damage other parts of your molecule. You know, it's kind of like you can imagine if you uh, had a big rock and you wanted to break it into smaller pieces, you could put it on the ground and wail at it with a sledgehammer. And that's going to be effective. It's going to break your rock up into smaller pieces. But if you had like, I don't know, like a sculpture and you need to get like a little bit of the rock off somewhere, you're not going to come at your sculpture with, with a sledgehammer. Yes, you're going to knock that piece off that you want off, but you're going to destroy the rest of it too. And HI is a sledgehammer. HI is like a really strong acid, really active. Great if there's nothing else on your molecule that can react with it. But in any sort of complex molecule at all, there likely will be. And we need sort of some more sophisticated methods. And we're going to be looking at that beginning of next unit. Great. Thank you, everybody. This is a great place to stop for the weekend. I hope everyone has a great weekend. And we'll see you all Monday.